The ups and downs of the tech sector continue, and a lot of people have turned to gold as it hits a new high. If you need help navigating all of this, you can head over to Wealthion.com slash free for a free no-obligation financial review. I'm your host, Andrew Brill. Let's see what our experts had to say this week. He is the CEO of David Wu Unbound and a former top Wall Street analyst. David Wu joined Wealthy on this week and expressed concern over upcoming turmoil in the market due to the conflict between Israel and Iran. He also is concerned over Israel's lack of transparency about their plan with respect to their border conflicts and how it will affect the upcoming presidential election. Tensions continue to rise between Israel and Iran, and I want to get your current assessment on what's happening there and what's going to happen in the coming weeks and months. Yeah. Hi, James. I mean, thanks for having me. I mean, as you said, I'm in Israel, and all I can tell you is, from my standpoint, you know, I think, you know, if you think about geopolitical risk in the Middle East over the past year, since, you know, the, the attack on Israel on October 7th, I would say geopolitical risk right now is probably at the highest level. In fact, higher than any time I can remember for the last 20, 30 years. And, and what I mean by very high is that, you know, the risk of a direct war between Israel and Iran, the two arch rivals in the region, is very, very high. I don't think it's been higher, I think, in my lifetime in any event. And I think from that point of view, if over the past year, the market had been concerned about a regional war, Okay. Only, I mean, the market didn't really care about the Israel-Gaza war. You know, I mean, people got killed, but the market didn't really care. And nor did it care about the Ukraine war, as long as the Russians and the, um, you know, the Ukrainians were bogged down. You know, like the market wasn't worried that it was going to have spillover effect, much like basically the Gaza war. But Israel and Iran is a very different story obviously, because Iran being, you know, a major oil exporter. And so from that point of view, and Israel obviously goes out saying it's very important in tech and so on and so forth in terms of U.S. basically presence in the Middle East. But I think in general, there is no doubt. I think all people need to know is this, which is that Israel is going to retaliate after the strike against Israel two weeks ago now, basically by Iran. I can still tell you that it was a pretty scary moment. I was hiding in my own I've got a nuclear shelter here in my house with my dogs who are, were completely traumatized because the explosions were really, really very loud. I'm talking about explosions of the Israeli anti-missile system basically taking down those Iranian incoming missiles. But the point here is this. What you need to basically know is that Israel will strike back, probably will be very soon, soon meaning that in days as opposed to in weeks. And I would say, most importantly, there's a very good chance I think Israel is going to strike at Iran's nuclear capabilities. And I think this is very important because there are two questions that I think people are interested in right now. One is basically what exactly Israel is going to hit. And two, what is Iran going to do afterwards? Okay. Now, first of all, I think on the question of what Israel is going to hit, I mean, there's been a lot of speculation. Is Israel going to, you know, basically, uh, is, it, is Israel going to uh, hit uh, Iran's oil fields? I think that's going to be the last thing <laughs> on Israel's basically agenda. Because first of all, oil fields, you know, you could basically blow them up, but they could be, uh, they could be repaired actually. And they'll be up and coming. They'll be up and going again after three months. So you can only bring about temporary disruption if you were to target oil fields. And then at the same time, of course, if Israel were to take out Iranian oil fields, forget about what it means for oil price immediately. Most likely Iran will retaliate by basically attacking the oil fields of Israeli allies in the Gulf, meaning UAE, maybe even Saudi Arabia, and so on and so forth. And I think from that point of view, the last thing Israel wants to do is to basically put its allies, okay, in the Gulf in an awkward position. So I think that's the first thing. I don't think oil, as much as I do think that there could be secondary impact on oil price, I don't think the effect is going to be of the first order to the extent I think Israel, if they can... Basically, if they can somehow not basically touch the oil fields, I think they will go out of their way to basically avoid it. Now, of course, the real question is, will Israel try to go after Iran's nuclear program? I think that is obviously, you know, the most important question everybody's asking, right? Let's put it this way. You know, as you probably might have heard, last week there was an earthquake in Iran that was, that was recorded as a 4.5 Richter scale earthquake. And it was 10 kilometers deep. 
and it was very close to a nuclear reactor, okay? And so a lot of people, a lot of experts have been sort of speculating whether that was an, a nuclear test, okay? Now, again, let's just say it's 50-50, okay, it was a nuclear test or not. What we do know, even from Anthony Blinken, who is, you know, I don't know if he's an authority on this issue, but certainly he is very pro-Iran. So I think from that point of view, if he says so, I'm going to take it as a given. Even he admitted recently that Iran is only one to two weeks away from basically getting a bomb. Getting a bomb, meaning, let's be very precise about this, Iran has enriched a lot of basically 60% purity uranium, okay? Enough for them to make five bonds if they were to go to 99%. And what Anthony Blinken means by one to two weeks is that if Iran tomorrow were to decide to go for the purity 99%, guess what? It will take them about a couple of weeks. <laughs> To basically, to basically move from 60% to 99% in order to make enough, basically, uh, to make enough ma ma material to make at least one bomb. Okay. So Iran is, is either already in the nuclear threshold or has already crossed it. We don't know. We also know basically that six months in the last basically few months, Iran has successfully tested nuclear bomb detonators. Okay. At the same time, we know as a fact that Iran now has very good ballistic missiles. I mean, the ones that they shot at Israel, you know, two weeks ago, they were called basically the Fatah 110 missiles. These things actually have a range of about 300 kilometers. They can carry, you know, you know, essentially up to half a ton of weight, which was a lot of explosives. And on top of that, most importantly, they're equipped with precision guidance. Okay. So basically, Iran already has the delivery mechanism, they've got the detonators, and they're just a couple of weeks from basically crossing the nuclear threshold if they haven't done so already. Like, no sane country at this point will say, you know what, let's just leave it alone. <laughs> let's wait, let's sit on our hands for another couple of more years and see what happens. Israel has no choice because at this moment, this is existential. Okay, so I think from that point of view, whether Israel has the capabilities or not, I think everything they're going to be doing, I think, is going to be trying to slow down Iran's nuclear capabilities development. I think what they can. Now, of course, I think they're probably going to hit at the infrastructure of the of the Revolutionary Guards because you know the regime in Tehran is propped up only by the Revolutionary Guards who are widely hated across the country. So I think from that point of view, like Israel is definitely going to go after it. the military infrastructure, the missile sites, the launchers, the airplanes, the, uh, they don't have much of an air force, but the tanks, the training center, the whole shebang. Okay. So I think it's going to be something like that. Now, I think, you know, I think obviously the question is like, where does the U.S. come into this? Okay. Now, the only thing we know is this. Who knows? I mean, there's a lot of, you know, smoke and air and this kind of thing. But I think, you know, I do trust, okay, media reports that claim that, you know, Israel has not so far shared its plan with the U.S. Okay. That makes sense to me at many different levels. But let's just take that as a given right now, that Israel has not yet shared its plan with the U.S. What does that mean, you might say? To me, the fact that Israel has not shared its plan with the U.S. means, number one, that more likely than not, Israel is going to do something bigger than what the U.S. will basically, uh, what Biden will basically, uh, will allow. Okay? So from that point of view, like, that's one reason not to share with the U.S. if you think that U.S. is going to try to hold you back. So, therefore, you don't even tell the U.S., just go and do it. Okay? The second thing I think we can assume if Israel indeed hasn't shared its plan with the U.S., is that Israel plans to do this by itself. And it has the capabilities to go do it by itself. Now, again, Israel has been preparing for this for the last 20 years. I'm going to assume that Israelis have the abilities. They know what they can or cannot do, the constraint, and so on and so forth. So I think from that point of view, this is going to be a very important thing. And by the way, as far as the U.S. is concerned, and this is where we can bring in the U.S. election to some extent, which is that everybody knows, okay, that if Israel and Iran were to go to war, okay, that this will probably help boost Trump, okay, in the election, right? Because, you know, if you look at various different polls, 
the feeling is that I think, you know, that most voters feel that, you know, Trump actually, the, you know, is, will be better for the U.S. in terms of foreign policy than Kamala Harris. So any sort of, you know, foreign, a sudden escalation in terms of geopolitical conflict, you know, I mean, a war between Israel and Iran, it's going to be like front page news. It's going to be like, you know, literally every day, that's all you're going to be reading about it. That sort of thing, I think, which will signal failure of U.S. policy towards Iran over the last, whatever, four years under Biden, there's no doubt that's going to benefit Trump. And to the extent I think Jerusalem does not want to be viewed as trying to influence the U.S. election by, you know, sort of like by attacking Iran, I think you're going to have to assume that Bibi Netanyahu will probably want to get this thing done sooner rather than later. Sooner meaning the next basically week, 10 days, as opposed to getting too close to the U.S. election. Because if Israel were to attack, let's just say a week before the U.S. election, there will be a lot of people saying, oh, well, Israel was interfering with the U.S. election, that so on and so forth. I don't think Israel wants, Israel is not, Israel needs to hit Iran, not because of the U.S. election. Israel needs to hit Iran because it's an existential threat. So I think from that point of view, I think that this is going to happen sooner rather than later. Our partner, RIA Jonathan Wellam of Rockling, joined us and raised concern over long-term growth sustainability because of the deficit. He talked about Rockling's strategy for long-term growth and wondered if equities are becoming overexposed to risk because of complacency. He also discussed the hole TD Bank finds itself in after some hefty fines. So, Jonathan, even though you're based in Toronto, much of your portfolio is comprised of U.S. names, so you're well acquainted with the U.S. markets. What's your take on the U.S. economy right now? Do you have any concerns? Well, this, the concerns that we've talked about even, uh, you know, in the past, uh, first of all, the economy is chugging along. It's, it's amazingly resilient. It's probably one of the most resilient economies in the world. And that's uh, testimony to a very dynamic uh, market and certainly a dynamic economy and uh, dynamic investors down there. Also, I think it's indicative of a lot of deficit spending. And so, as we know, the government is spending on about 6% of GDP or more in terms of its deficit. So debt continues to go up. But overall, it's been very resilient. It's not growing quickly, um, as we know in the numbers. And there's been lots of adjustments to the to the uh, employment numbers and so forth, but uh, it has been chugging along, plodding along better than certainly the European economies, better than the Canadian economy. And uh, as we know, China also, although they're doing a lot of stimulus, so overall, not too bad uh, for the US, but we have the same concerns, a lot of deficit, you know, deficit spending, massive debt. Uh, where does all this go? These are all structural. It's going to be very difficult to get out of that situation. And uh, they're going to have to, you know, more and more pressure to continue lowering interest rates in order to get the interest costs down and to keep the economy uh, above uh, above water. So, and I'm glad you brought up TD Bank. I was going to ask you about that. And so just to uh, lay the groundwork for our viewers, uh, TD Bank uh, got hit last week on the back of uh, an official ruling out of the SEC. The fine was over $3 billion dollars number of restrictions on terms of future growth in the U.S., and that's what was driving the growth in, at TD Bank. And now it's probably the worst performing bank in North America. It's down 8% on the year. Uh, so would you not revisit it given the evaluations, or do you think it's there's more to come on the downside? Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, so, no, we will revisit it. Uh, we'll, it won't be for a few more months. We'll let things just settle out because our overall view in the banks is uh, is neutral at best. And so we're not enthusiastic about it. We're looking at other spaces, but it, it is setting up for a perfect opportunity to buy a very well-run bank. I mean, obviously they made a major mistake um, in, a, in a couple of the segments in the U.S. And uh, unfortunately that can happen with uh, collusion amongst a number of employees. And it was serious. And as we know, if you get into trouble in the States, they'll take you out to the woodshed and really beat you up and uh, extract as much money out of you as possible. But the bigger issue for, for TD Bank is that they are now limited in growth. Um, you know, they've been slapped. And uh, so from a regulatory point of view, they really can't grow the business in the States now for a couple of years. And that is probably the biggest impact in terms of valuation on the bank, because Canada's already super saturated. As you know, it's already an oligopolistic situation up here. So it's, uh, there's really not a lot of growth in the Canadian marketplace and everybody's up to their eyeballs and debt anyway in Canada. So um, expanding their balance sheets in Canada is going to be a, a trickier business. 
So that's um, that's something though that uh, we will be definitely looking at, and there could be a great entry point uh, and opportunity when this thing, when all the dust settles, and that shouldn't be too far out. Um, and certainly, banks learn from their mistakes, and uh, um, we'll 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 see about uh, that. That could be a great opportunity. Yeah. I recently spoke with another fellow Canadian, David Rosenberg, and his big concern is one of complacency, mm-hmm. and he's also concerned that many people are too overexposed to equities, especially baby boomers. And he's made mention of the fact that no one does research anymore. They just buy, right? And uh, are you concerned that there's this level of complacency out there? And regardless of what's happening in China, China is maybe imploding, regardless of the hostilities in the Middle East, regardless of what's happening in the US or in this upcoming election, the, the S&P and the NASDAQ just keep going higher every day. Do you are you concerned at all about this level of complacency that's out there? Yeah, no, I mean, David Rosenberg, I think, is an excellent analyst. I followed him from his uh, Merrill Lynch days and uh, and keep keep up with what he is saying. Um, he's, he's, a, he's a very, you know, prudent individual. He, he's very numbers oriented. He gets right into the uh, the nitty gritty, and I like that. And he's, he's prepared to take a contrary position, which I love. And so I do think that he is exactly right. People are complacent. And that's largely because with interest rates being so low um, up until more recently, you had to sort of look for a dividend. You had to look for that return. You weren't getting it on cash. And so people did uh, go into the market. And we've now had, I mean, other than the COVID um, you know, situation where the price, uh, you know, the stock markets dropped for a couple of months, but not for very long, we really haven't had a down market in any substantial way since 2010. So, you know, you've got 14, 15 years of a bias to the upside, and there's no question then you get complacency into, um, you know, being priced in. And so people just start to expect that uh, they're going to get 10% rates of return, 15% rates of return year after year. But as I think David Rosenberg also points out, you've got this massive um, aging of the population and you're going to have more and more people living off in some of their investments. And so if they are heavily weighted in equities and there's anything that happens to the equity markets, they they come off a little bit. You could get a knee jerk reaction, more of a knee jerk reaction because of the allocation, the equities is so high that people could come out and that could certainly cause a, a larger down downdraft in equity. So, no, I think people need to be careful and um, there is a certain degree of complacency. The way we try to get around that is we do own what we hope to be assets that uh, can go up when the market goes down. And so, you know, we have a little bit more in precious metals, certainly a lot more than the average investment advisor or the average Canadian is we would be running you know, high teens, maybe maybe 18% of our assets or more um, exposed to precious metals and some of the commodities, which we think would be somewhat of a hedge over time uh, to a weak to a weak stock market. So, yeah. And I want to spend a couple of minutes on your investment style at RockLink and how it compares to that um, uh, with Warren Buffett. And maybe you can just tell us about it and what's your investment style? Well, we try to use many of the same principles that Warren Buffett utilizes. And that is that do we, we try to look at companies with, um, with moats, um, good protection around them, predictable businesses with a track record that uh, is, uh, is excellent um, in, in fairly you know, strong um, long-term growth industries. Um, try to buy companies, again, that really do produce free cash flow and are good investors in terms of investing back in their business. So they, you know, they have their own built in, you know, hurdle rates and things like that. So you can get this natural compounding. And uh, so, we, you know, we try to utilize, you know, strong balance sheets, um, very defensive businesses, but uh, can grow, grow quickly. So, um, you know, we, that, that's where we try to utilize a similar type of investment philosophy. We're not looking at speculative stocks. We're not looking at junior securities. We're not looking at um, stocks that have a you know, great idea and sound you know, might turn out well, but they've already proven um, and ha- by their track record that they know how to make money and they have a cash flow uh, that's coming out of them that we can value. And we don't have to be um, you know, um, making wild assumptions in order to justify the valuation of those businesses. So some of our top holdings um, would include businesses that are in the technology space. So we would have you know, some, some of like Roper Technologies, which is a you know, major software kind of company, but a lot of industrial software. So it, it's, it's a leader in a number of uh, 
different industry verticals. We love that type of business. As you know, a software business is a great cash flow business, reoccurring. You get embedded in people's businesses. You have high retention rates, things like that. Um, Buffett, of course, does not invest in precious metals. And so we would differ with them there. But when we go into the space, we try to go through royalty companies. So they're really investment bankers to the mining businesses. And uh, we like that because they do create a cash flow stream that you can value and um, you can look at the counterparty risk and countries that they're in and, you know, build up a, a comfort zone with the risk profile, things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, we own some consumer, you know, consumer staple businesses, which, of course, Buffett likes uh, companies like Church and Dwight. Uh, we've owned Nestle in the past. We've, we've lightened up our position there more recently. And uh, in financials, um, we know financials, even though we don't own some of the banks, we also um, certainly will invest in other financials. Um, like the like the Brookfield companies, which are you know infrastructure, but also financial companies, and um, you know Burford Capital, which provides litigation finance, things like that. So, in all the companies that we're looking at, do they have a long-standing business? Are they run by sharp people? They know how to allocate capital. They're generating free cash flow. Uh, we can value them in the marketplace and justify what we're paying for them today. And uh, the future looks pretty bright for them in terms of the industry dynamics and growth opportunities. You mentioned royalty companies. So what royalty companies do you currently own? We do have exposure to, you know, the big the big ones, um, you know, Franco Nevada. Um, and uh, we've actually started adding a little bit more to it once it got tr sort of knocked down a little bit because of the uh, the trial and tribulation there in uh, in Panama with the Cobra mine where they, they had the, the copper mine shut down. Um, but uh, we do own some Franco Nevada. And uh, Wheat and Precious Metals has been a, a very, very large holding for us for some time. And uh, Randy Smallwood uh, runs a, you know, a really beautiful business there. Lots of, lots of growth and uh, good capital allocator. And uh, Osisco Royalties. And we also have some Sandstorm, which is a very strong company. We th their profile, they have a doubling. Um, it looks it's certainly built into their business, a doubling of revenue over the next five years. And I think uh, Nolan Watson's positioned that company very well. Even if the price of gold goes sideways, you're going to get a lot of growth in that business over the next few years. So those are some of the some of the you know, major royalty positions that we have. And how many names would you have in your portfolio? We like to focus. I mean, one of the things that uh, from our perspective is, is people often diversify. Uh, to use Peter Lynch's old uh, expression, I think he had that in One Up on One, w Wall Street, but a uh, fantastic book he wrote back in the late 80s, early 90s. And so you can be in too many places. That's why we don't, we're not big ETF guys and index investing. So we typically have 20 to 25 stocks with our top five or six companies um, being, you know, 35 to 40 percent of the portfolio. So f for us, it's all about knowing the companies, researching them, and then having a, a heavier focus on the companies that we really like, that um, we think are well positioned and can grow very quickly over the next little while. And uh, we think that's the way that you can outperform and also manage risk because you understand the businesses really well. Tian Yang, who is the founder and CEO of Variant Perceptin, joined Wealthion and explained what Schrodinger's recession is and what is keeping the U.S. from entering a recession. He also touched on the inverted yield curve and the challenges the bond market faces ahead. Tian also spoke about China and how its economic challenges affect the global markets. <music> So in your article, you talk about Schrodinger's, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, recession. Can you explain to us what exactly that is and, and where we are with that? Oh, yeah, yeah. So so this is the, the very famous Schrodinger's cat um, experiment, right? Where he essentially says, you know, you have a box, you put the cat with some poison inside the box. Before you open the box, is the cat dead or alive? Well, it's both simultaneously, right? Until you open the box that you find out. And I think that's been a... A very nice analogy for for this uh, post COVID economy we've been going through, where we've had you know various signs, right? There's been like you know jumps in layoffs, right? You know certain things like SARM rule, which are linked to historically jumps in unemployment that normally mark recessions, right? There's been some of these worrying signs, yet there's been some pretty good headline growth numbers, headline um, consumer numbers. Um, so. Yeah, so I think that that's where the analogy to Schrodinger's recession comes in, where we had lots of differing factors. So it's simultaneously been a recession and not a recession. And I think what's been happening year to date so far uh, is that broadly speaking, a lot of the, the leading indicators in the economy have been stabilizing and um, recovering. There's obviously 
you know, a bit of a bit of noise. This is a pretty consequential U.S. election that's distorting some of the data. But broadly speaking, we're kind of saying if you lift the box now, it does look like we've weathered um, a lot of the the drags that would have historically resulted in a recession. But due to the fiscal, you know, due to the government intervention, due to the fiscal policies, you know, due to the, the better household balance sheets, you know, the, or the deleveraging post COVID. Um, they have helped to kind of hold hold things up this time around. So when you lift the box, it, it looks like no recession. Tian, if we're averting a recession, obviously the economy, as you say, is growing but slower. What's keeping us from entering a recession? Um, if that's possible, so, actually. <laughs> yeah, so obviously there's some pretty credible people talking about how the Fed's already behind the curve, right? It doesn't matter if they cut too late. Um, so... I, I think it's it's worth thinking about recessions as kind of a, a phase shift rather than like a smooth process, right? I think that the analogy is kind of like you boil water and boil boil it, and then it's that moment it turns to steam. That's kind of the phase shift, and you go into a recession. So if you look historically, it's not like you know growth goes from two percent to one percent to zero to minus one and it's smooth, right? It's kind of a jump, and so the only situations in which these kind of jumpy feedback loop phase shift recessions happen is when everything aligns. So that's, so it's not just so much that growth is slowing because growth slows and accelerates all the time. The key is that a lot of these feedback loop mechanisms are in place. So uh, for example, if say the Fed was going to hike interest rates and credit spreads widen, then clearly businesses will have to pay more to borrow. And so if they start to struggle, they will lay off workers. If they lay off workers, their incomes go down, then consumption goes down. So more businesses revenue get hurt and that feedback loop kicks in. And then that's very hard for policymakers to stop. And that's what the recession is, right? It's kind of these feedback loops that accelerate and you get the phase shift. Um, the difference this time around is that only really the start of 2023 met those kind of initial signs of a phase shift, which you know, after kind of Silicon Valley Bank, the Fed actually managed to step in and bail everything out and they actually stabilized a bit and growth held up. And I think since then, none of these historically needed um, kind of sequences are actually in place today. So we, we're pretty much out of sync, right? You know, we we had the, the housing stress last year, right? In terms of transactions, certainly manufacturing was in recession last year. It's kind of coming, you know, it's kind of stabilizing now. Obviously, there's some concerns around election uncertainty, but if you just look at delivery times, they're kind of picking up. Um, again, U.S. consumer, right? The, you know, it's been fine. It's not doing amazing. People are clearly concerned about personal finances. Inflation price levels clearly do matter. Um, but in aggregate, the data's held up because it's been a, a pretty bifurcated consumer. The bottom one third are struggling. Price levels, credit card debt stress, that really is a problem. But the top third have been doing pretty well. All their asset prices are up, house prices are up, right? You know, they, they, they're selling low mortgages. The biggest companies done well. They locked in issue debt when it was much cheaper. So we haven't really had that feedback loop, that kind of, you know, incomes falling, leading to more layoffs, right? That's kind of what's been missing. So in, th in that sense, it, yeah, th that's kind of what you would expect to see. And obviously we don't have a crystal ball. We can't see exactly what's going to happen in the future. But right now, it doesn't seem that obvious. Um, we're going to get kind of big income shocks that will lead to more mass layoffs that lead to more income shocks. Right. Plus, plus, as I said, when the government deficit is running six, seven percent of GDP, and there's a lot of politically driven needs to spend money, right, whether it's on entitlement, but also industrial policy, you know, in the name of national security, that's a lot of spending to come. And that also, again, helps prop up the private sector balance sheets and stop um, or at least ameliorate the worst um, the worst risks of like these income layoff recession shocks. So I want to talk about the bond market a little bit because and I, I need I, I read your your article on the bonds. It said, you know, the twos and tens are getting a lot of a lot of attention because that that price hasn't really dropped all that much. But if I'm correct, it's the three month bonds that the Fed looks at, you know, against each other when they're looking at interest rates. I, am I reading that correctly? Right, right. Um, yeah, so this is linked to the, you know, the, the, 
the the conventional wisdom is that the yield curve is one of the best predictors of recessions, right? You know, it's kind of undefeated. It will right. eventually be right. And what we've seen this time is that the yield curve has had one of the longest period of inversions ever without recession. And but the argument goes normally when it uninverts, i.e., the you know when when the two year yield goes back below the ten year yield, that's normally the the beginning of a recession. Um, the the Fed um, researchers did a lot of work on this before, and what they found is that the main curve they actually look at is the three months interest rate against the three months interest rates 18 months forward. So it's like a forward space, right? So you're kind of, so effectively it's, just, it's saying, what does the market think three months rates are going to be 18 months from now, very roughly, right? Versus today. And is it going to be high or lower? And um, that curve and that uninversion they found is more predictive of recessions. And so that curve hasn't moved basically. That hasn't actually, that's still kind of pretty inverted as of right now, but obviously things can change. Um, and it's also just worth bearing in mind, again, when we live in a, a world where there is a bit more uncertainty around inflation, right, in terms of the volatility of inflation, that will affect how good nominal, um, nominal yield curve is. And also, you know, the market is not fully self-determining, right? We know the Fed does QE, QT, they can impact the amount of bonds in the system. You know, the, the Treasury in recent years has changed how they issue bonds. So they've gone from issuing very long duration, long dated bonds to issuing more short term bills. And so, again, that's taken kind of the supply of duration away from the market. So there's been a bunch of these things that's happened that's impacted the kind of supply of bonds available for, for kind of private sector to invest in. And so the net result has actually been to suppress a little bit the um, what's called the term premium, essentially just the additional risk people put on longer dated yields. So that there's like a bunch of these things that's kind of kicked in. So it's more saying the, the two stands might be a bit more noisy than historically, right? You certainly shouldn't be relying on it as the main thing. So let, let's talk about China a little bit. I know that you're skeptical about the stimulus, but w what is happening with the Chinese economy and how is that affecting the global economy? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the, the framing when it all kicked off on that Tuesday morning was, I think this is a, a tradable bazooka and tradable means next one to three months. So regardless of what you think on China, if you can be flexible, there's money to be made by buying it. Right. So I, I, I framed it as it's a tradable bazooka, but not a real economic bazooka um, in the sense that economic bazooka is where China would need to really address a lot of their structural economic problems quickly. And if you address it quickly, then it's not a case of where the Chinese equity is going to be up 50 percent. Right. If you address the economic issues, then you want to buy Chinese equities because it's going to be up 300 percent. That's the difference. So I, I don't think we're there. I think um, for Western investors, you don't have to invest in China, right? There's other things to do. So the one option is, and it could be the right answer, just, yeah, whatever. It is what it is. I don't need to participate. If you want to participate, I think the thing to think to, to realize is I think the Chinese way of thinking and doing things are a little bit different. You know, Western policymaker bazooka literally means bazooka. Like we're going to, you're going to know what we're going to do now. It's going to be a front. You'll know the size, the amount, the impact, the market will discount it and we're away. I think in the Chinese kind of, you know, MO, the way, you know, the phrase is typically like crossing the river by feeling out the stones. So a decision is made. We try things for a bit. We see how it goes. We do things a little bit more. Things go through some committees and what, you know, this gets signed off and we do more. Like you do kind of eventually get there. But it, it probably isn't as, you know, flashbang wall up exciting that, yes, this is resolved now. And I think that that's one of the, the probably gaps in what's going to drive a lot of the volatility. Um, but obviously, the structural problem is extremely well known, right? At this point, we're like three years into this. So it's not like anyone is not 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 aware of China um, and the problems. But I, I do think, you know, the, the analogy is probably somewhat similar to when they um, ended zero COVID that clearly the pain point was there, had been hit for the, the authorities in terms of local government, finances, you know, in terms of the economic stress and, you know, unemployment, youth unemployment, you know, things that matter socially, right? So I think because those pain points were hit, again, 
like any government, it's very reasonable for them to want to do something about it, right? Um, but, and that will clearly be beneficial for shifting the narrative, stabilizing the economy. Obviously, there's a lot of policies to try and boost equity prices, like directly, you know, facilities for people to borrow money to buy equities is pretty direct. Um, so in that sense, I think it's pretty tradable. Um, but I don't think this spells the major change in how China wants to operate um, and how it sees itself in the world, right? Like, you know, the, the phrase like capitalism with Chinese characteristics, right? There's, there's a different order of priority, I would say. It's not just about profit maximization and growth maximization, right? Like there's a lot more concerns around national security, food security, energy security. If you look at how many like, you know, solar panels China's building, right? You know, they want to reduce their dependence on importing oil that comes from the Strait of Hormuz that, you know, if an adversary wants to cut you off, you just cut off, right? There's just tons of more, I guess, real world geopolitical things that I, I think they deem as important. And that obviously takes slightly higher priority than the economy. So it's like a balancing act. Michael Nicoletto's founder and CEO of DeFi Advisors joined us on Speak Up this week. He explained why the world economy is really important and how U.S. monetary policymakers are working for the entire world and not just the United States. He also spoke about the strength of the dollar and state of the U.S. economy. With its march upward, Michael also touched on the sustainability of the stock markets. Michael, I want to ask you, what do you believe to be the state of the economy here in the United States? We'll get to overseas because I know that you're an expert there as well and have a lot of opinions about China. But I want to ask you first about the United States. Well, clearly there's a slowdown. The question is if this slowdown will become a recession. If you ask 100 people, you get probably not 100 different answers, but you get a few different answers. So. It's hard to say what's going to happen. It's clearly there's a slowdown. The Fed wants to get ahead of the curve by cutting rates aggressively. We saw the first 50 basis points. And it's looked like that it's going to cut another 50 until the end of the year. And I think probably if we continue to cut rates at this pace, we might avoid the recession or we might have a very shallow recession, if I can say that. I don't believe we're going to have a hard landing. Now, this is not... Uh, a standalone case, meaning that the ECB is cutting rates, China is giving tremendous amount of liquidity in the system. So all that liquidity helps eventually the US. We will come that later in the discussion, I guess. But my view is that the liquidity all over the world ends up in the US. So uh, given that it's the most competitive and the largest market in the world, money tends to come to the US and that helps the US in many ways. It, and that'll you, you think that'll strengthen the dollar? The dollar seems to be somewhat strong right now, but do you think that, that the increased liquidity around the world will help the dollar? I think structurally we're in a dollar bull market. I think in the next few years we're going to see the dollar much higher. We don't see the dollar high right now because the ECB was forced to cut rates because the European Union is mostly in a recession. So to a common and we saw also the yen falling and we saw also the Chinese currency falling. So I think, and we know that central banks talk to each other. It feels to me that, among other things, the Fed wants to help the entire system and lower the dollar so to give liquidity into the entire world system. The, the dollar is a funding currency of the world. So when the dollar rates go down and the value of the dollar goes down, it alleviates pressure from mostly emerging markets and for foreign companies which borrow in dollars. So this is... The dollar by itself helps the entire world. Given that everyone's cutting rates at the same time, besides Japan, it helps the entire liquidity system to come into the markets. It's it's an interesting concept that the, the U.S. would try and keep the dollar a little bit lower to help the, the rest of the world. Explain to our viewers how the world economy is really important, because a lot of people worry about themselves and their own pocketbook. But if the world is struggling and the U.S. seems to be doing great, it still isn't doing all that well, is it? Well, okay, the U.S. has the, the, let's say, the privilege of its economy being driven by the consumer. More than 70% of the GDP is driven by the consumer. So as long as the employment market is good and the U.S. people make money and they consume, the U.S. economy does well in, in principle. Okay? 
Now, clearly, there are more things to add to it. But this is the, the, the advantage that the U.S. has. Clearly, when there's a global recession, exports fall. U.S. companies can't export a lot, and they have enough, and they get affected on their balance sheet. So it's not. It, it affects. It clearly affects the U.S., but I think it affects less than it will affect someone else. And given that the U.S. has the U.S. dollar, and the U.S. dollar is the global reserve currency, which accounts for more than eighty percent of global transactions, the U.S. has the unique privilege of being able to issue as many as much debt as it wants or as many dollars as it wants because global demand is so huge that they can afford to do that. Other countries which are not the global reserve currency cannot do that in that magnitude. And that's why we see sometimes currency crises around the world, especially in emerging markets which have uh, liquidity needs a bit different than the US. It's an interesting concept and I don't think, you know, and I'm so happy you're here because nobody's put it in those terms where the the U.S. federal, you know, policymakers actually thinking about the global economy, not just the United States, whereas we just think about the United States. But it's a it's a I think that it's a, a really, really good point that we're not just working for ourselves. We have to work for the entire world because we are the currency of the world, basically. So I think that it's a, that's a great point. I appreciate you making that. Let me, let me say a few things. We've seen a lot of discussions about the new BRIC currency, which is supposed to substitute the dollar as a global reserve currency. And the argument is that the huge deficits and the huge debt make the dollar unsustainable. Now, if you take the BRIC currencies and you see their financials, trust me, they're not better than the U.S. Also, most of them have capital controls. But again, if if that was the case, you would see other currencies strengthening and getting a part of that dominance. But that doesn't happen. So the U.S. has the privilege and the responsibility of having that, uh, that uh, utility. Now, if they cannibalize it and they weaponize it, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm saying if they were to do that, they were to strengthen the dollar, then they would, they would increase the probability of other countries trying to find another way and finding another currency that would not be easy. It would take 10 years and more, but they, the drive would actually be serious. Mm-hmm. I don't think the efforts which we see now are very serious, and I don't think there's a threat at this stage for the U.S. dollar. How much does that affect trade when the dollar becomes too strong? How, how much does that affect trade? U.S. exports or imports? Well, it affects it in the current account. So if it strengthens, it exports less. If it weakens, it exports more. But that's not the only thing that the U.S. is looking at. There are a lot of other issues in the economy that you need to pay attention to. The, the, the exports are one, one component of the economy. But as I said before, the consumer is the driving force in the U.S. So the first and most important thing is to look what the consumer is doing. So this is why the Fed is looking at the CPI and the inflation to see if it's coming down, because when prices go up, it puts pressure on the consumer to spend less. When unemployment rises, again, it's the same thing. That's why the Fed has a dual mandate of price stability and full employment. It needs to focus on these two things to keep the economy, the U.S. economy growing and continue to grow as it has in the past years. So, Michael, let's look at the markets for a minute. The U.S. stock market equities just keep rising and rising. Obviously, that's got almost nothing to do with the economy, but how sustainable is the U.S. equity market right now? Well, let me put it, first of all, markets are a relative game, not an absolute game. So when you're an investor, you need to find where to put your money. So there are a lot of options, but if you look at it, if you step away and you see where is the best market to invest, you'll see that the U.S. is the best market right now. So in terms of growth, in terms of prospects, in terms of uh, transparency, in terms of structure, the U.S. The, the US economy, the, the U.S. bond market, for example, trades like, I think, 15 trillion a month when mm-hmm. Europe trades like less than, if I'm not mistaken, around five, six, so, and China around two trillion. So you understand when you have such a broad market, it tends to help investors feel comfortable to invest in. Now, what drives markets right now is not valuations, it's liquidity. 
And if you look at global liquidity, we see it clearly increasing. And that liquidity is what driving is driving markets. Many will come up and say, guys, the valuations are through the roof. They don't justify the earnings. Okay, I, I hear that. For example, the, the hottest topic is NVIDIA. Okay, so we've seen NVIDIA <laughs> in every headline. But again, first of all, NVIDIA always outperforms its forecasts and has a forward B of, let's say, around 36, 40. I haven't checked today. I want to remind investors, because I, I used to trade the market in 1999 and 2000. When liquidity comes into the market, and it comes at the basis we see now, because this is the pace of, with which liquidity comes into the system is unprecedented from any standard, markets tend to go crazy. And I think we're at the stage where equity markets in the US will do very well in the next six months, even if valuations don't justify it just because the liquidity will be there and you need to put your money somewhere and versus other equity markets, the U.S. is the most appealing one. Thank you for watching this week's recap. If you need help planning your financial future, head over to Wealthion.com slash free for a free, no obligation financial review. And please follow us on social media. All the links are below in the description. If you haven't done so already, please make sure to like and subscribe to our channel and don't forget to turn on notifications so you never miss a video. Thanks again for watching. If you like this content and are looking for more ways to keep growing your investments, watch this video next. Until next time, stay informed, be empowered, and may your investments flourish.